much. Pleasure. Uh, everything's good with your family? Baruch Hashem, yeah. Everything yeah. with you? It seems like the U.S. is burning, is on fire. Yeah, it's a very difficult time. But thank God our family is good both here and in Israel. Baruch Hashem. And please yeah. say Hadassah, Shalom from me. I will, thank you. We're seeing a lot of each other these days. I say, I say we're seeing a lot of each other these days. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right I know the situation. <laughs> Thank God we have a good relationship. Yeah. Oh. I, I will ask you a few questions about the situation in the U.S., like the first okay. three questions. We have about 30 minutes. It will take more, like now when we record yeah. it. But 30 minutes for the interview, and we have 10 questions. Uh, so there is about three minutes for a question. Okay. Um, I hope it's okay. If you would like to, of course, if you like to uh, have more time in one of them, so I will follow. Uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll adjust as we go on. Sometimes it's hard to answer. You have big questions in three minutes, but I'll try. Okay. The, the, the worst uh, is... The worst is you don't uh, get to ask all the questions, but we'll try to get to do all of them. There are so many interesting topics to speak with with them with you about them, so uh, it was hard to choose. Okay, understood. No problem. Uh, Ariel asked me to say that uh, they're going to see both of us all the time because uh, the, sh the screen will uh, will be divided to two. Uh, right. So pay attention. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, Ariel, whenever we can start, just yeah, let... I think, uh, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, whenever is a good time, uh, I'm already recording the session. Um, yeah, so in your time. Good, ready, whenever you are. Okay, so let's start. Uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, former Democratic nominee for Vice President, I'm honored as always to be speaking to you today. Thank you so much for finding the time in a world full of commotion and distress to stop for a moment and focus on a topic that touches us all as a central anchor in Jewish life, the Shabbat. You describe, it you describe it beautifully in your book that will soon be available in Hebrew, The Gift of Rest. Uh -huh, thank you. <laughs> See? <laughs> well done. So let's start. But first, we cannot ignore the reality outside. And if I may start with a couple, a couple of questions about the current situation in the U.S. Sure. Could you share your view on the current turmoil in the States, the latest violent incidents which have reignited uh, the public discussion around racism and division? There are those who take advantage of the circumstances mm -hmm. to hurt Jews and Jewish institutions like synagogues. What do you think will be the effect on Jewish community and do you think the Jewish community has responsibility to take action and leadership in this crisis? Wow, that's a big and, uh, but it's an important question. So, I mean, first off, I'd say that um, this, somebody else said, it's not my line, that slavery is the original sin of American life. And we have been dealing with it uh, since, um, really almost our beginning when there were slaves, certainly there were slaves, beginning of American history. Um, in my own lifetime, I'm, I'm proud to say that, that I've seen and in a small way been part of, you know, the civil rights movement when I was younger and then civil rights legislation. So that there, there's an end to legal segregation based on race. There's been tremendous uh, uh, improvement in the place of African Americans in American life right up to the presidency. Uh, but there are still um, two things. One is an enormous amount of poverty among African Americans. Uh, and, um, uh, and secondly, obviously, as we saw in this tragic and just infuriating uh, murder, I would call it, of George Floyd in Minneapolis, a, a mistreatment of um, black people in America uh, based on their race. And uh, this is all boiling over now, <clears throat> as it has before in our history, 
and it's boiling over now at a time when the society is already uh, stressed uh, because of the COVID-19 virus and, and the economic dislocation. So, you know, we have to restore order. I mean, we're a society of law. And when I say restore order, I mean, find ways to stop police from mistreating black people based on their race. It's just unacceptable in America. And the second, of course, we can't have a civilized society in, uh, in which people are uh, provoking essentially anarchy, looting, uh, uh, just uh, insecurity on our streets. So hopefully we can do both at once. I, I don't think there will be any uh, uniquely or disproportionately adverse effect on the Jewish community in America. Um, I, I think in, in, periodically a synagogue will be marked up and God forbid something maybe a little worse. I hope not. You know, in other words, uh, uh, there's destruction of property going on all over. <clears throat> What's the role of the Jewish community? Historically, the Jewish community in America have been great uh, advocates for equal treatment, equal opportunity and equal treatment under law of all Americans, including African Americans. And I think we have to, as a community, rush to the uh, frontier, uh, which is our, our mandate from uh, Har Sinai, uh, and uh, speak for the law, speak for humanity. And that means doing both, uh, about speaking out against maltreatment of African Americans and also speaking out for the restoration of um, law. In, in our uh, cities, which are really uh, almost anarchical now. So this is a tough time in our history. We have an election coming up, as you well know. It's hard to say how that will play out. Uh, will people go a little more toward the right, which would be re-electing President Trump uh, in terms of these domestic issues, or will they go to a, a, new, a new face, new person, not new to them, but new to the presidency? And, uh, Joe Biden, and uh, it's right now. I would say it's up in the air. Do you think we might see a raise in the Aliyah for a, of Jews from the states? Yeah, might. Um, it's an interesting question. I don't think it'll be an enormous increase in uh, Jewish Americans making Aliyah, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some uh, tick up. Again, I want to stress that at least I I don't find at this point that the Jewish community in America feels uh, particularly sort of targeted by these demonstrations or by the African-American community. My, my own sense is, frankly, that there are a lot of uh, young uh, Jewish Americans in these peaceful protests, hopefully not in the more destructive anarcho anarchy-like uh, 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 protests, but uh, that that would that's typical. Look, when I was a young person, I went to Mississippi to uh, to kind of, uh, get black people the right to vote. I marched in the march with Martin Luther King in 1963. I mean, and part of why I did it was what I thought was my heritage as a Jew and my obligation to uh, to be part of a, a different kind of yetzia, which in that case was from. Uh, segregation in America and racial discrimination. Beautiful. To a different subject, um, there has been a lot of going on recently in the relationship of President Trump with social media, particularly Twitter. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you if you support the executive order that exposes social networks to liability for content posted on their platforms. Yeah, I support uh, President Trump's goal. <clears throat> I don't know if what he did was effective. And here's what I mean. I, I've been focused on this for other reasons. I'll tell you in a minute. There, there's this uh, Section 230 of what we call the Communications Decency Act, a great name for a law. Uh, it's been on the books for quite a while. And it essentially says that uh, Internet companies, social media companies, have no liability for content. In other words, they're not like a newspaper which can be sued uh, for material they print um, or even a, a TV station. And uh, I first confronted this um, oh, a few years ago when it became pretty clear to me that a lot of terrorism 
was being stimulated on the internet with the use of social media. And the social media companies were taking no responsibility for it. The same is true today of anti-Semitism. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time looking into the backgrounds of the two men who committed the murders at the synagogues in 2018 and 19 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Poway, California. And there's no evidence that either one of them belong to a neo-Nazi or a racist or a hate organization. It, but there was a lot of evidence that they were inflamed by what they were following on the internet. And therefore, we've got to find a way to force um, social media companies to, uh, to begin to take some responsibility for what goes over their uh, media. Uh, it's not easy just because of the enormity of how many postings there are on, uh, on social media. Uh, for a while, I was in an argument with YouTube about uh, uh, videos of the radical Sheikh uh, Alaki, who was ultimately killed by an American drone, uh, to get it off of YouTube because we had evidence it was stimulating terrorist action here because he spoke English. And, uh, you know, to make a long story short, the people at YouTube uh, said to me, well, how, do, how can we tell whether he, what we're putting up is a regular sermon of his or it's jihadist? And I said, you know, you can tell. <laughs> and uh, I think they're going to be under pressure now. There'll be a movement in Congress, which will probably be more effective, to repeal or amend the so-called Section 230 and um, I, I think the, the, the social media companies have such phenomenal technological capability that they can figure out a way uh, to do this. Incidentally, the last word, um, the Congress did amend this law to provide some kind of liability for social media companies when uh, their uh, vehicles were being used to uh, bring about um, sexual abuse of children, basically. And if they can do it there, they can do it in other areas like hate, uh, mm -hmm. terrorism, and anti-Semitism. Interesting. Okay, one last question about American politics, but relevant okay. to the community. You know, I'm sitting in, the fr in front of the most senior Jew in the Democratic Party and in the American politics, and there is no doubt about your deep devotion to the state of Israel. Similarly, I have friends who consider themselves Democrats. So can you help understand the sociology behind President Trump saying, I think if you vote for Democrats, you are very, very disloyal to Israel and to Jewish people? Well, uh, you know, he, basically that's a political argument on behalf of himself. And the truth is he has been, um, I would say one of the most pro-Israel presidents that uh, we've had since the uh, establishment of the modern state in 1948. Fortunately, there's some great pro-Israel presidents. Um, so that's part of the record. I mean, it happens that Joe Biden, uh, who I know for a long time, served with in the Senate for 24 years. I'm sure if you talk to the pro-Israel community in his state of Delaware, they would tell you he's been wonderfully supportive of Israel. My guess is people uh, in the Israeli government over the years would say the same. Um, but it will be an issue because there is on the left of the Democratic Party a group that uh, is not as reflexively pro-Israel as the Democratic Party has been through most of my life. That's a great concern to me. And uh, it'll be worked out at the convention uh, of the Democratic Party this summer, whether it's real or virtual may be expressed in the platform, uh, and it will be important. A lot of people who care about Israel, Jews and Christians, will be watching that, and I hope it comes out where Joe Biden himself, as the candidate for president, has been for his career, which is to be pro-Israel. So we will see. But I, 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 that's how I analyze that comment by President Trump. Like a lot of comments by President Trump, it may be a bit edgy, but I think that's what he was trying to say. Interesting. Okay, so let's dive into the Jewish educa Educational Challenge. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Mr. David Friedman, said that the greatest threat to American Jewry is Jewish cultural illiteracy. 
could Shabbat provide an opportunity in this sense? Yes, uh, thanks for asking that. Obviously, uh, I love the Shabbat. I, I, I consider myself really blessed to have had the opportunity to write the book about Shabbat called The Gift of Reds. I'm blessed doubly to have uh, Koran publishers with the support of Shabbat Unplugged, you, Ruth, Dr. Ruth, uh, to, uh, uh, to be publishing it next year uh, in Hebrew. So I would, uh, David Friedman is a dear friend of mine. I think he's been a wonderful uh, U.S. Ambassador to Israel. But I would say that um, two things, uh, depending on how you look at this question of Jewish literacy in America and probably around the world, in some sense, there's more Jewish literacy than there's ever been because there's, we're at an age of an incredible uh, publication of Jewish texts, etc., and uh, uh, the growth of a, uh, of a Jewish day school movement that is not just uh, Orthodox yeshiva, but goes over to modern Orthodox uh, conservative, and in some cities uh, in America, reform Jewish day schools. On the other hand, it's still true that uh, a very significant minority, and maybe a majority, of, well, a little majority of Jews are not even directly affiliated with Jewish organizations. And so, yes, I think uh, the Shabbat is a door into Jewish literacy. And uh, I'm speaking now as somebody raised in an Orthodox family um, who uh, observes Shabbat according to halakha, but I think we, we have to have a kind of feeling of outreach, of cure, of bringing in about Shabbat. Uh, and I always remember, and I quote this in the book, I had a friend uh, at my show uh, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, I remember his name, Arthur Spiegel, of blessed memory. So uh, I had a conversation with him once about Shabbat, because he came to show all the time. But he told me that uh, uh, very often he went out to lunch with his wife on Shabbat, and maybe sometimes went to a concert. So I said, look, and then I, he looked at me and he said, everybody should be able to make their own Shabbat. And I, uh, that's a simple story, but I couldn't agree more. And there are so many ways to bring people in with parts of Shabbat. I mean, here we have to uh, follow the wisdom of the of Chabad and the Lubavitch Rebbe of blessed memory. Let's go mitzvah by mitzvah. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you about what you're not doing. I'm going to thank you for what you are doing. What do I mean? Um, there are simple things that people, even without a very deep Jewish background, can do. For instance, uh, a Friday night meal. Um, maybe you learn how to make Kiddush, maybe you don't. Maybe you just know how to make the mozi. Okay. You can also, uh, uh, something that's universal and powerful, uh, bless your children. Give your children the bracha. Mm -hmm. uh, um, hopefully you'll, you'll find a, a, a Beit Knesset that you feel comfortable in, but maybe not at the beginning. Uh, maybe you'll do what you, <laughs> the title of your organization suggests Shabbat unplugged. I mean, in the modern world, the beauty and power of Shabbat is amplified by the fact that we're also constantly connected, no getting away from uh, electronics. And yet, as I say in the book, for me, probably the most difficult moment of approaching Shabbat, uh, in addition to when I was in the Senate and making sure I somehow got back to Connecticut before Shabbat began, but the difficult moment is turning off my smartphone because hey, what's going to happen you know but <laughs> then when I do it it's a metaphor for Shabbat uh, I feel like I'm liberated and so that's another way maybe you'll say to people maybe we'll say to people about Shabbat as a way to get into it and improve Jewish literacy just why don't you start by turning off your smartphone I'm going to tell you a quick story that I, I don't I think I tell in the book, but this man did a nice comment on the book. His name was uh, Cecil, I think it was Samuel, said I could be wrong. Anyway, Mormon, president of Brigham Young University. I sent him the manuscript. He wrote a beautiful comment about the book. And then he said to me uh, after that, that he read the book and he said to himself, I'm, I'm letting my smartphone interfere with my Sabbath on Sunday. So he said, after I read your book, I decided I'm turning my smartphone off. So he said, 
He created a small cool. camp on the Brigham Young University campus. They couldn't get the president. But I, I knew, I explained to them, and I also knew if there was a real crisis, I live on the campus, they'd come and get me. And uh, he said, you know, as a result, my Sabbath, my, my Mormon Christian Sabbath, is much more meaningful to me. So there's a lot of doors into this for Jews and non-Jews. And um, I, I think it's a wonderful device. I really am thrilled, uh, Ruth, by what Shabbat Unplugged is doing. I think it's a wonderful way to bridge the, the, the religious gaps in Israel. I think there are a lot of people from my many, many, many visits to Israel who are not that tea but they, they're, they're not pillow need, or they really want They're just to be, Jewish, yeah. They're Jewish. I remember uh, I saw a poll once a few years ago that almost 25% of the Israelis self-identify as Masorti. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'm not Dati, I'm not pillow need, I'm, I'm traditional, I'm Jewish. I, I want to be Jewish. And Shabbat, in however they enter, is a way to do it. And once they enter, if you can get them to study and learn. Listen, one of the great things about Shabbat is that it gives us time to learn and study, either through the Parsha most, most significantly. Somebody said to me once, a rabbi really, and I thought it was beautiful, that uh, we have Jewish denominations. It's very hard for us, unfortunately, to all come together in our tzilot because we have different um, and hugging different halakot, but there's nothing stopping us from learning together. We could all sit together and learn Torah, Talmud, whatever. And Shabbat is a great day to do that. I totally agree. And what I'm impressed most is that when you were already a senator and former nominee for vice president, you decided to write a book about Shabbat, which you described as your love song for, for Shabbat. Yeah. So, beautiful Thank you. asking myself that it seems that Jewish philanthropic world did not yet uh, put Shabbat high on its agenda it's true that the Vichai Foundation and the Jewish Federation of New York uh, did ap approach and meet the subject uh, but they are quite unique do you think there is room and need for other in Jewish philanthropy to deal with Shabbat as an educational opportunity and perhaps, as you said, tied to modern life challenges. Yeah, no, I, I agree totally. Look, if you, uh, there's been a lot of uh, thinking, talking, and, and uh, giving uh, around the question in the U.S. about what we call Jewish continuity. How do you sustain the Jewish people? A lot of good focus on day schools, Jewish day schools, yeshiva, and uh, also on summer day camps. <clears throat> but I think Shabbat has that same uh, capacity, and I hope to bring people in, and in some ways to bring even more people in than Jewish day schools or uh, summer, Jewish summer camps, for all the reasons that we said before. And as a result, I, I do think that Jewish philanthropies would be wise to give more and more to groups that are reaching out to be, to be Makar, to bring people in to Shabbat observance in different ways. Your group does a great job. I know that, you know, Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Goldstein of South Africa has a program. And, um, it's kind of, a, it's amazing. For instance, how many, in some of the cities here in the U.S., how many people get together on the Thursday night before that Shabbat to make challah. The other part of Shabbat that is remarkably accessible for everybody and quite beautiful is Havdalah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, the ceremonies. Uh, yeah, the ceremonies, and there's a background, there's a mood, um, and uh, everybody's together. Years ago, uh, Hadassah, my wife, and I went and spoke at a retreat, probably a thousand people for the uh, young leadership of the American Jewish Federations. Uh, Friday night, Shabbat morning, services divided. Orthodox, conservative, reform, maybe reconstructionist, I don't know. But everybody got together for Havdalah because we, we could all accept, uh, embrace it. 
And it was quite beautiful, not just because of the Havdalah, but because we were all together. <clears throat> and I hope, you know, that can be a model. So I, I think, in my opinion, and I'm not here to mark it, but I think uh, Jewish uh, philanthropic dollars, um, tzedakah will return uh, probably the greatest, invested in uh, Shabbat will return uh, the greatest uh, dividends. Uh, because of what, what an extraordinary idea it is, uh, what a reality it is, and how much it relates to uh, our life uh, today. As you know, and I'll be re really brief about this because I know we don't have all day. I, I went through periods of my life where I wasn't observing Shabbat, particularly when I was at college. And I came back to it slowly, uh, but I really missed it. And when I came back to it, you know, sometimes the rabbis and others say, uh, you can't really appreciate trying to live by the mitzvahs unless you've, you've had some averas and you're fasting. I don't know if I endorse that, I'm not a rabbi, but uh, I will just say that it was a reality that I left Shabbat for a while. And- um, You actually write about it in your book and it's very interesting. You're writing that when your grandmother uh, passed away, uh, yes. Well, that your connection to Jewish life is dependent now only on your actions, and this is when you came back to Jewish life and specifically to Shabbat. Exactly right. There was a moment. My grandmother lived with us. We lived with her when, early in my life. She was my mother and father were observant, but she was like to me represented Yiddishkeit. And when she when she passed away at age eighty six. So I felt that, a, you know, the metaphor of, of the, the chain of Jewish history and that link was out. Now the question was, was I going to go in and fill that space or just stay back? And I just felt I had to do it. It was a certain responsibility. But of course, in the end, it was one of the best things I ever did in my life. It was very, I mean, for me. It's very exciting to read about it in your book. And also it really made me think about the connection between Shabbat and Jewish continuity. And you, yes. before, it's a gate. It's an opportunity for education, for, for to, to speak and to work about Jewish continuity. No, I agree. You know, it's the, uh, I, I sort of do the Mahat Ha'am, or uh, paraphrase it in this case. Mm -hmm. Really, it's not so much that B'nai Yisrael has kept Shabbat, but Shabbat has kept B'nai Yisrael. And of the various explanations of Jewish continuity, I would say that, of course, the Torah is, is the essence of it, but, um, but, but Shabbat observance really has, uh, has been responsible for the fact that we're still here after these thousands of years. And I think that they guarantee what by this time we should have concluded uh, scientifically, which is that we are an eternal people. It just depends which of us are going to step in to fill those links so that uh, it's eternal. But as we, if we don't, somebody else will. Um, you know, it's very interesting because in Israel, we mostly uh, fight on Shabbat, also on Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> and as you well uh, acquainted with the Israel society and government, I wanted to, uh, to ask you, uh, how can we uh, make Shabbat a common value in Israel? Why do you think that we fight so much about Shabbat? How it can become a common value and uh, part of the Israeli uh, national ethos? Yeah. So first I meant, uh, I thought you meant by fighting good, uh, healthy uh, disputation debate about or Talmud, and that, that's, that goes on too, and it should go on. It's the model of uh, Jewish learning and Jewish history that we can figure out how to disagree without uh, dividing. Um, but you're, you're asking a good question, and I, I think there has to be an understanding, and again, I'm coming at it from the observant side. There has to be an understanding that um, it's in a, particularly in a Jewish state, uh, it's difficult because it's a state that wants to live by Torah, by halacha. On the other hand, it can't be, in my opinion, uh, done in a way that seems to push people into a lesser status or make them feel 
that they're pushed out. I mean, just as, you know, traditionally, and still today, but in the, when centuries ago, there was a, it's a funny metaphor. I don't think I've ever used it before, but I'm thinking about it because of Shavuot and uh, sweets. Uh, centuries ago, the uh, teachers of uh, Judaica, when they started with children, would always give them candy. It was an association with the learning to make it um, more attractive. But today, in many uh, shoals in America, maybe in Israel too, there are candy men who give out candy. It's not such a bad idea. So we need more adult candy uh, and not the closed door. You're, you're, you're not doing it the way Halakha says you must do it, therefore you're not, uh, not only not Shor Shabbos, you, maybe you're not even really Jewish. You can't do that. I mean, we're all so about Ahavat Yisrael. And, uh, and the mission, the mission is to uh, extend the mitzvot to more and more people. Uh, and Shabbat is the beginning of it. So, I mean, I would just say it needs leaders, uh, who are tolerant, who are willing to meet uh, on common ground. And what could be better common ground than Shabbat, which is our way of thanking Hashem that we're all here and also acknowledging uh, uh, Hashem's role in history and our responsibility to sustain that history. And also in a modern time, Shabbat unplugged, just pulling back and having a kind of sanctuary in time where you're unconnected from the electronics and you have the luxury of 25 hours to spend with your family, uh, to read, to walk, and to go out into nature, whatever. The things you don't have the opportunity uh, to do the other six days. So I, I think we've got to go at this with, with sweetness and frankly, love of our fellow Jews and a desire to welcome them into Shabbat observance in whatever way is comfortable for them. Yeah, you know that uh, the result of criticism uh, about Israel's lack of responsibility to the world Jewry, and I wonder if Shabbat can become a bridge between us, and what should the Israeli government do in this regard? Well, I really, that's a, that's a really uh, good suggestion. And um, I'm not sure I have an answer for it, but about what the Israeli government should do. Look, um, a lot of American Jews get um, turned off by Israel because they feel that the uh, religious parts of the population and the government that make them second-class citizens and uh, that's not healthy. It's not even good for U.S.-Israel relations, but it's not what I think the uh, Torah and our tradition tells us to do in treating each other. So um, I suppose the Israeli government could lead in trying to create, um, I would again use the term doors into Shabbat for people who are not uh, that key, and frankly to be supportive of Shabbat outreach programs um, both in Israel and throughout uh, the Jewish world. Um, I think there's an opportunity here to build bridges and overcome some of the suspicion and distancing that affects people. I mean, I remember I, I had a colleague in the Senate who was Jewish um, and uh, let's see if I can remember, and a great supporter of Israel. Um, one of his children uh, married somebody who wasn't born Jewish, had a conservative conversion to Judaism. And, you know, he said, my uh, child's spouse uh, is not accepted in Israel as Jewish. And that really hurt him. So, um, and of course, he felt maybe he wasn't accepted because he was, he, he uh, davened at a, a reform, sometimes conservative, mostly reform congregation. So these are, this is not what we were meant to be. If, if I or you welcome people in the Shabbat observance who don't observe it like we do, halachically, that doesn't stop us from observing it halachically. Yeah, but, but as a state, what do you do? 
Like you need to decide if there will be buses or won't be buses, if there will be a, a uh, or not. You know, the, the, I think that okay. the issue is that we are a state. Yeah. Okay. That's that's difficult, um, and I don't have an easy answer to that. I mean, I can tell you on one side, I have children living uh, in Israel, and uh, they live in a, a pretty from area. And uh, being there on Shabbat or the Chagim is, is an unbelievable experience. Moving, nothing's on the road. The kids are walking in the street. Talk about the tranquility of Shabbat. So um, I would hate to see that destroyed. There's got to be ways to figure out. But very few people in that city want to use a bus on Shabbat. So, I mean, I would be, and here I'm getting involved in politics, I shouldn't get involved in, but I would. Uh, tend to make the buses available where you can, in a way, on Shabbat, that doesn't, um, doesn't limit the ability of uh, that T Israelis from observing Shabbat as they want. I mean, that, that, you know, this is a strange comparison. Uh, when I was growing up in Stamford, Connecticut, the Jewish community was strong, but a definite minority. It was a, a Christian majority. So there was a big fight one year about a nativity scene, the statutes of Jesus and parents and on the town green. And there were some Jews who were really, uh, and others, who were trying to stop that. It was like a, a violation of their religious freedom. So my grandmother, who we mentioned before, who was uh, an immigrant from Europe, from the Carpathian mountain area, Romania when she came, now Ukraine. Um, she said, I don't, I don't understand this. What is it that, what does that bother me? I mean, I walk like by it on my way to Shul on Shabbat, uh, but nobody, everybody's welcoming me. My Christian, my neighbors say, Shabbat, Shul, good Shabbos, good Sabbath, Mrs. Monger. So that's their religion. It doesn't bother me. So, uh, I thought she was very wise, and uh, I think a little of that uh, has to be brought into Israeli public life so everybody feels part of the national kahila. That's the important point. That's the strength, ultimately, of the country. It's interesting because the, it's very similar to what happened with your book. You also address as non-Jews and drew interest from a non-Jew such as President Bush. Uh, I wonder if you see Shabbat uh, as an opportunity to connect between Jews and non-Jews. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I know there were people when I got involved in politics, and I'd already come back to uh, Shabbat observance when I started. Uh, at first, they were puzzled, sometimes a little angry. Why can't you come to my political event on Friday night and Saturday? But um, once they found out that it was because of a religious obligation, and I was doing it consistently. They, they really respected it, not just accepted it. And I found throughout my uh, career that actually my um, religious observance, and particularly Shabbat, because it was public, um, was actually not a divider, but a bridge between me and uh, the Christian majority uh, most of whom believe in God if they don't go to church every Sunday or Saturday they believe, Saturday night. They believe in God. And uh, I can tell you a lot of stories, some of which are in the book, but uh, I don't want to give away the whole book before they go out and get it. Uh, but uh, uh, I always felt that people actually respected me uh, and it, for observing Shabbat. And it was one of the things that interestingly brought me closer to Al Gore, who was who gave me this extraordinary opportunity to run for vice president of the United States. He didn't do it because I was Shomer Shabbat, but he was fascinated by it. And uh, he had he had gone to divinity school at one point, so he was very interested in religious questions. I just say a cute story. He said to me that he really, in some ways, envied me that I didn't uh, get involved in politics on uh, Shabbat. And he said, you know, I, if we get elected, I 
think I'm going to stop doing political events on Sunday. So he said, here's, the, here's my recommendation. He said, I, Al Gore, on Saturday, I'll watch the store. On Sunday, you'll come in and I'll watch the store. <laughs> So unfortunately, it never happened. But that that shows you what a what a connection it was. So maybe on a personal note, for the end of this fascinating conversation, you can give us a tip for Shabbat, and if possible, from your Shabbat. I speak for a, a tip, an advice for Shabbat, something that you particularly like from your Shabbat. Something oh, th thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, wow, there's so much to choose from because I love the whole day, <laughs> really. Beginning with, you know, uh, I, I have a partner in Shabbat Observance and my wife, Hadassah. And so just coming to the table, a Shabbat table, it's different. It's, it's set out with a different tablecloth. There's beautiful dishes. Uh, glasses, etc. Um, the bracha of the children is an important moment in grandchildren to me, which gives me a lot of satisfaction. We have a strange minhag of our own because our kids are now dispersed all over. That's even before the uh, virus. And uh, I, 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 I name their names, which now Baruch Hashem, we have 12 grandchildren. And I then say the bracha. And uh, almost as if I'm and I say where they are, just to focus my bracha off the satellite so it bounces down to them. It's an important time. Look, I love the uh, collegiality, the community of the kahila, of the of shul. I miss it a lot now during the virus. And, um, uh, and learning, listening to a good sermon, believe it or not. And then just, you know, Shabbat meals, Shabbat, the Shabbat nap really is a, taste of Olam Haba. Anyway, <laughs> and then Abdullah, the, the whole day is, is really, as I say in the book, it's a gift. When I was a kid, I thought it was just full of restrictions that my parents were making us do. I left it, I came back, and the more I've gone on in my life, I realized it's one of the great gifts Hashem has given us. So how could you turn it down? I totally agree. And I think that even if you are secular or religious, it doesn't matter you, you can find your own way to Shabbat and find whatever you uh, uh, want to do in Shabbat and what is important for you and your family. Uh, I, I could agree with you more. And you've done a wonderful job, Ruth, through the organization, your own work, and conveying that message in Israel. And I think in doing it, you're not only bringing more people into Shabbat on terms that are helpful and, and open to them, but you're helping to unify the country. And uh, that's really important, too. Thank you so much. This is very exciting to hear, especially right. for you. And I really want to thank you uh, for taking the time and sharing with us your in invaluable point of view. Uh, it is really inspiring to see a prominent figure like you have the commitment to deal with educational topics that stand at the core of Jewish existence. I hope others in Jewish world will follow. And thank you also for your commitment to Shabbat Unplugged. Uh, as you uh, uh, almost mentioned, you are serving as our honorary chairman, and this is right. a great honor wow. for us. Uh, and finally, I hope we overcome today's grave challenges and come out stronger and more united. Amen. Amen. Be as right as and you know, our whole history tells us that we will. Uh, we we faced challenges before. We have that in our. Jewish DNA, and uh, we, we understand we have a responsibility to act smart now uh, and use our creativity to, uh, to find treatments, cures, and uh, we'll be back. <laughs> be mayor of you, mayor. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Joe Lieberman. It was fascinating. Thank you, Ruth. Be well, dear. See you soon. Tadaba. Tov, Ariel.